So the food tanghuru has been trending all over social media recently, and I've seen some heated online discussions regarding this snack. For those of you who may have been living under a rock, tanghuru is essentially fruits on a stick covered in hardened sugar, and they are very colorful and super pretty to look at, and they are great for things like ASMR because of this huge juicy hard crunch as you bite into them. They taste jaw-droppingly sweet, and they are kind of the worst things for your teeth. Possible side effects include cavities. So why am I talking about tanguru in this video? Well, I was scrolling through TikTok and I've been fed on my algorithm a number of videos from Chinese creators who are annoyed at the fact that tanguru is being branded as a Korean food or Korean snack. Now, let's get the facts straight. Tanguru originates from northern China and they are also known as pintanghuru. And the original tanghuru is made from hawthorn fruit, which is apparently quite sour in taste. And so the mixture of the sour and the sweet balances it out. Whereas the tanguru that's gone very trendy in Korea right now, that's all very sweet fruits such as strawberries, pineapples, grapes, and clementines, etc, etc. Now, tanghuru has existed in Korea since a while ago, especially in places where there's a lot of Chinese population, for example, such as Incheon's Chinatown and such. But since the second quarter of last year, that's when their popularity just exploded. You can see in this graph that the search for tanghuru just sh shot up astronomically in the second half of 2023. I don't know what the reason for this was. But anywhere you turn, you could see tanguru on TV being shown by celebrities or on social media by influencers and mukbangers. And new tanguru shops were popping up every week because everyone wanted to get in on the action. I literally have three tanguru shops near my vicinity right now. So due to the explosion of tanguru on Korean social media, people from other countries, and I would say in particular the West, they saw it pop up on their Instagram or their TikToks and they wanted to try it for themselves too. And I saw many videos of people who had traveled to Seoul, gone to places like Myeongdong or Hongdae, and they were saying, oh, I'm finally trying the viral tanguru. And I did see on these videos people hashtagging it as Korean food or Korean street food. And I also did see the angry commenters from Chinese people who were correcting them saying, no, tanguru originates from China, which is why this Chinese TikToker made this video and I'll play it for you right now. This is an article from the SF Chronicle referring to tanghulu, a Chinese food, as Korea's candied fruit craze. Why is it that Chinese food products culture is constantly rebranded as Korean or Japanese to be more palatable to a Western audience? And just because this food is popular in Korea right now, it doesn't make it right to refer to it as a Korean trend and not once mentioned that this is a Chinese food with nearly a thousand years of history. So obviously she is expressing her annoyance at this article, which was written by an American media outlet, not a Korean one. And yes, in the headline it says Korea's new candied fruit craze. But in the second paragraph of that article, it does mention that it is from China. Before we get any further into the video, I just feel the need to defend Koreans because I feel the portrayal that Koreans are claiming tanghuru to be Korean, this is extremely false. I can assure you that no Korean person living in Korea right now thinks that tanghuru originates from Korea. I can assure you that. All of the shops, when you walk into them, they have Chinese characters written all over the shops. What I think is happening is just foreigners who don't know much better, they just saw it trending in Korea within Seoul, so they just automatically assumed it was Korean food without doing much further digging. And there was a mix response of comments under that video. Some people were saying, yes, it's not Koreans, but it's the Western media who are branding it to be Korean because of the US and China relations right now. It's not very good. And then, of course, you have the other side who are very patriotic and nationalistic and they will just believe whatever they want to believe. So we have comments such as, one of the reasons our culture keeps getting rebranded into Korean is because the Koreans don't give credit or admit it is Chinese. Relax, Koreans don't have a lot of heritage. Let them steal some. Korean even tried to claim that Confucius is Korean. <laughs> I don't know where they got that from, but that is just simply not true. <laughs> Nobody thinks that. I've noticed a lot of trends that come from East Asia are usually Chinese, but are always rebranded as Korean or Japanese. Now, that comment I kind of found interesting, and this is the whole basis of what I'm going to be doing this video about. So when I read that comment, I was wondering what they were talking about aside from tanguru. And apparently it's things like Chinese makeup and nails that gets rebranded as Korean or Japanese. Can someone explain to me why every Chinese trend gets rebranded as Korean or Japanese. I saw these nails on TikTok and right away you're like, wow, those are beautiful Korean nails, right? But no, they're Chinese nails. It's like, okay, let me go do some research on what Chinese nails look like. Freaking Chinese characters and some red nails. Hideous. Okay, maybe it's just Google. It doesn't comprehend what I'm trying to ask. So let me type in Korean nails. Oh, no, no. Google understood what I was trying to find with Korean nails. It gave me beautiful, elegant nails. Wait, what is that? 
literally Chinese characters that says that this picture came off of the Chinese Instagram Xiaohongshu. Why does this happen? And this I have to defend once again because I have to assure you this is not Korean people uploading these images into Pinterest or whatever and hashtagging it as Korean nails. That's just people who are misinformed, who don't know much better from other countries, foreigners who are getting these pictures and just labeling it as Korean nails. Korean Korean girls are not going to be hashtagging their pictures in English. They're going to be hashtagging all the hashtags in Korean with hashtag nail art design or 요즘 유행하는 nail or so something like this, you know? Really not not many Korean girls are going to be on this side of global TikTok. They're going to be fed on their algorithm content from other Korean creators because that's the content they can understand really easily. And I'll show you that most of them are not even aware of this online chatter going on about nails and makeup and tanguru. I notice it because I can understand English fluently and I can see these videos going on. And this is why I feel the need to speak out when I see content like this and I see unfair comments such as Koreans are claiming this, this to be theirs. And it's like, we're not actually doing that, but maybe foreigners are doing that instead. And same with the makeup chatter as well. I can understand if you're from a Western country, maybe you think Chinese and Korean beauty all looks the same. But as a Korean person, I can definitely tell the difference. Korean makeup is definitely more about like clean glass skin, less dramatic on the eyes, but very pretty blush of color and color on the lips. Whereas Chinese makeup, it has similar aspects, but it's definitely more dramatic lashes, dramatic colors, and definitely a lot more glitter. So I can immediately tell the difference between these makeup styles. But again, with same as the nails. I guess foreigners, they like to save these makeup styles and they just end up hashtagging it Korean makeup. I think even just the volume of searches for Korean makeup far outweighs searches for Chinese makeup or Douyin makeup. But yes, I do understand the frustration from Chinese creators when they are being mislabeled this way. And if it were the other way around, I really think Koreans would not be happy about this either. I must say, Korea is a very trend savvy place. Whenever there's a next new big it thing, then everybody follows suit and very quickly. Whether it's Tanghuru or Baratang, which is a Chinese hot pot dish that Koreans also went crazy for from about 2019. And this issue of Maratang was brought to my attention when I saw a screenshot of a Chinese person complaining about this one particular incident. And this is taken from the Pijik show on YouTube, where it's three Korean guys. They're very funny. They speak in a mixture of Korean English and they get a lot of actors or K-pop stars to come on and talk to them in a mixture of Korean and English. And the issue that I'm going to be speaking about is from when Daniel Caesar came on the show. He's an R&B singer. I love Daniel Caesar. And I guess the guys, they were recommending him like, hey, you should do this in Seoul. Let us give you like a typical Korea travel itinerary. First, with your empty stomach, you have to eat uh, maratang. That sounds scary. Uh, maratang, right? No, no maratang. Oh, uh, you don't know mara soup. If you want to feel real Korea, you have to try mara soup with your empty stomach. Yeah. Very hot and spicy. Now this, what he said, I feel like I can't defend. And to be honest, I don't know why he said that. And if I were a Chinese person looking at this, then I would feel offended too. But it wasn't just me who felt like this. I saw in the comments of that video, Korean people writing in Korean. I'm not a professional, uncomfortable person. As in, I'm not a Karen. But it's a bit disappointing to recommend Maratang while talking about travel courses for Koreans. In a world-class global talk show like the Pizik Show, which represents Korea, it was a pity to say Maratang as if it were a Korean food that must be eaten in Korea. Since when is Maratang a recommendation on a Korean travel itinerary? So in terms of that particular incident, I just want to say to you, any Chinese people that may be watching, us Koreans don't agree with what he said or recommended and I apologize on his behalf because when I saw that I was a bit confused as well. But for those of you who may be watching my channel right now and you're from the west or just other countries, I know some of you guys may be thinking, oh my god, these East Asians, they get so worked up over silly nonsense and they fight so viciously over things like snacks and food, like this is such a big deal. And I've seen some people comment on these kind of things like, oh my god, nobody cares apart from you guys about this sort of thing. And yes, it can seem a little bit ridiculous. For example, in Seoul, we have this place called the London Bagel Museum and people literally queue for two to three hours to go inside and buy these bagels. And obviously bagels originate from Jewish communities in Poland, but there is no uproar from abroad who's saying, hey, you Koreans, you cannot be selling these bagels and also be calling the shop London Bagel Museum. You know, there's no uproar. But the history between the East Asian countries, so China, Japan, and Korea, the history runs painful and it's deep and it's very complicated and it's 
very sensitive issue because there has been many cases of what's seen as cultural appropriation. There was a whole issue back with some Chinese communities saying that kimchi is actually a Chinese food and there's an issue with hanbok, which is a Korean traditional dress. And I've heard that China and Japan also fight about the origins of ramen and sushi and gyoza, this kind of thing. I can't get into all the arguments because it's going to be such a massive long video, but you guys should just know that Korea has a history of being attempted to be dominated by the neighboring East Asian countries, which is why things like kimchi and hanbok are very sensitive issues. It's not just East Asians though. Mexicans, for example, they would take extreme offense if suddenly Americans were like, hey, American food, we have quesadillas and tacos and enchiladas. That's an American food. If suddenly French people were like pasta, lasagna, tiramisu, that's French national food. I think Italians would get extremely mad about this. Anyway, back to the topic of tanguru. Why have foreigners been assuming that tanguru is a Korean street food when it has been a Chinese snack for centuries. Now this is where the soft power discussion comes in. And what is soft power? Essentially, soft power is defined as a nation's ability to influence others through attraction rather than coercion or force, like military hard power. And soft power can be a powerful indicator of how a certain nation will perform in terms of investment, tourism, and talent attraction. And it's pretty clear that Japan and Korea are rather good at the soft power thing. Japan has been a powerful player on the world stage since the 80s and 90s and they have so much anime and games that they offer Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Pokemon, they literally have so much content and with Korea well K content has kind of taken over popular culture, Parasite won a Best Picture Oscar, Squid Game became Netflix's number one series, and BTS became the most successful boy band of all time. It still boggles my mind that a small country like Korea with a population of only 51 million people, the fact that we can export our media in our own domestic language to the rest of the world and have it catch on in such a massive way, it still boggles my mind. And I watch many TikToks of Chinese creators complaining that people tend to view Japanese and Korean people more favorably but Chinese people don't get the same treatment. Let me play a few videos. Why do people always assume that attractive East Asian people are Korean? So earlier I was at a restaurant in Times Square and as I was ordering my food, one of the workers at that restaurant were like, oh, where are you from? And I was just like, oh, I'm from California. Yeah, just visiting. And then he was like, oh yeah, because you're super pretty. And then like, obviously I was like, oh, thank you so much. And then one of um, their coworkers immediately went like, you're Korean, right? Or like, you're Korean. And then I'm like, no, Chinese. And then he kind of went like, oh, Chinese, you know, like, why do people just assume that if you're attractive, you're Korean, you know, if you're East Asian? I don't know. I just feel that like as a whole, people just kind of assume that Chinese people are like unattractive or like, I feel like people view like Chinese culture or anything Chinese as like less attractive because like Korea and Japan has like a lot of soft power. China has like, what's, what's the word? Hard power? The soft power of a nation is actually its most powerful weapon and the most important part of that soft power is through entertainment. Every single person on this planet likes to consume entertainment and it's much more easily and happily consumed than reading and watching about foreign affairs and politics around the world. Because not everybody has discussions every day about foreign affairs and foreign policies, but every person does like to consume foreign content, especially if it's very good and entertaining. Well, what is the issue with China and their soft power and why might it be not as effective as Japan or Korea's. There are a number of reasons for this. First, the entertainment that's created in China is extremely limited and censored. In Korea, we are considered to have freedom of press because we are a liberal democratic country. Of course, it's not perfect and there are several pressures, but we are considered to have freedom of press. However, China is run by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, and it is one of the strictest censorship regimes in the world. It is called the Great Firewall of China and the political censorship is built into all layers of Chinese internet infrastructure. As of 2023, the World Press Freedom Index lists China as the country with the second least press freedom in the world after North Korea. And if people in China want to access the global internet, they must use a VPN to bypass that firewall. The ending of the classic cult movie Fight Club in China, that got a completely different ending. So in the original, the narrator played by Edward Norton, he realizes that Tyler Durden played by Brad Pitt is his alter ego and up killing him off and um, he stands with his girlfriend as they watch as explosives are blowing up a bunch of skyscrapers suggesting that Tyler's anarchist plan to destroy consumerism is in the works. However, in the Chinese version, that final scene is just removed completely and it is replaced with a wall of text that says, Through the clue provided by Tyler, the police rapidly figured out the whole plan and arrested all criminals, successfully preventing the bomb from exploding. After the trial, Tyler was sent to lunatic asylum receiving psychological treatment. So yay, the ending in the Chinese version basically says that the police and the state came 
came to the rescue and successfully restored order back into the society. And the rebels did not win. If you guys have read the book 1984 by George Orwell, the CCP is essentially like that. Some other examples of words that are banned in China include Winnie the Pooh and <laughs> Baozi, which means dumpling, because there were memes going around that Xi Jinping, the president of China, there were memes saying that he looks like Winnie the Pooh or that he looks like a dumpling. So those words are banned. The Dalai Lama is banned because he is a symbol of Tibetan independence. The phrase go Hong Kong is banned for obvious reasons. And any discussion of the 1989 Tiananmen Square is extremely heavily censored. And that incident was where peaceful student-led pro-democracy protests ended up in gunfire and bloodshed by the government. This is a very highly controversial part of China's recent history and it's still unclear just how many people died in that incident because the CCP likes to keep it very hush-hush. And there was an incident with a Chinese influencer slash live streamer and he was named the Lipstick King because he was very good at selling lipsticks online and he disappeared from the internet for about three months after where in one live stream he appeared to present an ice cream cake in the shape of a tank and that tank is very sensitive in China because of this really famous photo of a student standing very defiantly in front of a tank in 1989. So yeah it's very clear that the CCP has a very tight grip on media that is put out by China and of course when entertainment coming out of a country is so heavily censored that's going to determine how cool or appealing that content is to a global audience. This is why China's soft power or China's entertainment simply just does not hit the way that Japan or Korea's does. The CCP obviously will allow and encourage content that will promote traditional Chinese values and talk about how great the Chinese culture is and some of the content that comes out of China is actually quite hilarious. I even sometimes cringe at the Korean government's efforts in Korea's promotional materials but China is something else. There's this really funny rap called This Is China sung entirely in English and it's the most earnest and serious piece of propaganda that I've ever seen. This is China, we love the country with the church for nominee and the red trekking in the evil but a peaceful place, the beautiful land we're rich culture. This song's mission is to restore the impression you have of my country, China, saying that a false image has been fabricated by the international media. It praises China's wonders, such as using mobile apps to pay for everything. And yes, it admits that China does have pollution problems, but it is a developing country and therefore it is really hard to manage. It touches on Taiwan and says that the international community simply just does not understand the relationship between Taiwan and its motherland and how everyone just wants them to be united as one. Go watch that video. It's honestly really, really really quite funny and I can just imagine that like a group of men from the CCP just sat together and they were like how can we make a promotional video talking about China and try to improve our image to the international community and this is what they came up with and some of the comments under that video I'm sorry but as a westerner I see massive meme potential in this I can feel the social credit flowing through my veins when I listen to this damn China you're really good at this whole soft power thing but this is why K-pop is seen as so cool in comparison to that kind of entertainment coming out of China because K-pop is allowed to be just you know the art itself it's just mainly about the catchy melodies and the catchy hooks and the eye-catching dance routines and the visually pleasing costumes and aesthetics and so it is allowed to be just cool but imagine if BTS had to come out with a song that was singing about like hey kimchi is the best side dish you'll ever taste and Korea has the nicest cafes in the world and we have the best affordable health care so <laughs> I don't even want to imagine a world in which that happens, but that would be just just terrible. And the reason why works like Parasite and Squid Game resonated with so many people around the world is the fact that it has themes that everyone can relate to. The greediness of people, the wealth gap between the rich and the poor in a capitalist society, but it's all filmed in a super stunning and entertaining way with lots of twists and turns and of course superb acting. Art and entertainment should focus on just that, being entertaining and resonating with people. But if all the media that's put out by a country has a hidden political agenda in trying to promote Mode, how great that nation is, then of course all of that content will lose this joy and charm and authenticity. And it actually made me feel bad for the artists and the creators within China because I'm sure they want to make the art that they want to make without having to go through a whole censored propaganda machine. But also people living in China are blocked from seeing the content that's on the global internet. They cannot access platforms such as YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Netflix, unless of course they use a VPN like I said. And instead they have their own versions of these platforms that they can access within China. And their own domestic market is actually so huge that 
the producers and the content creators can afford to just focus inward towards their own people. Whereas Japan and Korea, we do prioritize on trying to export our content globally. And we are also perfectly free to do so without any, you know, firewalls. Hence why when the Tangulu craze swept over Korea, people overseas became interested in it because they saw it. But if the social media content coming out of China is heavily vetted and censored, then it's simply just not going to resonate with the rest of the world as much in comparison. And I really think that this is a shame. And finally, yes, in the current world affairs, we cannot dismiss the fact that US and China relations are at an all-time low, probably. This is why the US congressman Tom Cotton was heavily grilling the TikTok CEO in the recent hearing. Of what nation are you a citizen? Singapore. Are Senator. you a citizen of any other nation? No, Senator. Have you ever applied for Chinese citizenship? Senator, I serve my nation I'm in asked, Singapore. I, no, I, I did not. Do you have a Singaporean passport? Yes, and I served my military for two, two and a half years in Singapore. Do you, have any other, do you have any other passports from any other nations? No, Senator. Have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? Senator, I'm Singaporean. No. Have you ever been associated or affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party? No, Senator. Again, okay. I'm Singaporean. Let me ask you some... And because TikTok is owned by a Chinese company called ByteDance, the US is worried about its national security, possible data breaches, the fact that that user's data and location can be turned into the CCP. And this is why many nations around the world have actually banned their government officials from downloading TikTok onto their phones because of these data concerns. I've also heard rumors, I'm not sure if this is 100% true, but this is what I've heard allegedly, that the Douyin algorithm, and Douyin is the Chinese version of TikTok, their algorithm pushes out much more useful, educational, beneficial content, whereas, you know, the global TikTok is much more based on dances or viral trends or just like much more kind of mindless entertainment. Who knows how true or accurate this is, but I think this might be something to consider. So yeah, this is a very long video talking about the soft power discrepancies between East Asian countries, all spawned out of this Tanghulu snag. What do you guys think? Why may the rest of the world look upon Japan and Korea more favorably than China? Let us have some civil discussions down in the comments down below and I'll be looking forward to reading your thoughts. Please make sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on new videos. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye!